Good evening. And now, for my pleasure to introduce the Vice President of Programs, Rita Bonacera, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Rita. It's about my family's journey 
from communist China to inner city Oakland, California. And it's about my journey of getting to know freedom. But what I'm really thinking, usually what's really on my mind, is that I need to hurry up and write another book about myself. And when I do, then maybe I can go to all those places that Barack Obama has been able to go. Yes, we can. <laughs> I, I'm joking, of course. I was not born in this country, so I can't become president. <laughs> my hopes up for a very long time. <laughs> he kept telling me and everybody else that Barack Obama wasn't born in this country either. So when Barack Obama finally released his birth certificate in the 2012 elections, I was pretty devastated. All my hopes for the White House were dashed. It's a feeling that I'm sure Senator Marco Rubio will become quite familiar with in 2016. <laughs> In any case, when it became clear that writing another book wasn't going to do anything for my political ambitions, I decided to focus on telling people about the book that I have written. And I think it's a book that's, that was worth writing for its own sake, and, um, and let me tell you a little bit about it. My story is an immigrant story, a legal immigrant story. <laughs> I was born in China at a time when the country had been devastated by decades of totalitarian communist rule. My family lived in an apartment that had no running water, no modern toilet facilities, no washer, no dryer, and none of the other amenities that we take for granted here in the West. And in fact, we lived in a place that was considered to be quite um, quite modern and, and quite enviable for folks in China because we lived in a city and we did not have to do that big back-breaking farm labor. Back then, everyone who could leave China for America wanted to leave. Everyone who couldn't leave wanted to leave too. So when my family had the opportunity to come to America, we immediately took it. We moved to Oakland, California, knowing almost nothing about it. Uh, we showed up there because we had relatives and we wanted to be close to our family members. Yet, instead of finding an America where the streets were paved with gold, we found crumbling schools, unsafe streets, and racist people. Mm -hmm. That was because we had arrived in the inner city of America, the heart of the welfare state. One by one, the horrors of the ghetto showed themselves to us. Poverty and urban decay plagued our new city. Storefronts had shattered windows. Streets were pockmarked with potholes, bridges, and tunnels were splashed with graffiti. The streets downtown, even near City Hall, were often streets that smelled of urine. Homeless men and women aggressively panhandled, and that was when they were being nice to you and they accosted tourists and residents alike. Crime plagued our new city as well. Drug dealing seemed much more prevalent at times than employment. Muggings took place in plain sight, and gunshots rang at night, regularly interrupting my TV watching. Racism also ruled my town. Asians, and it didn't matter if we were Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Filipinos, or Japanese, we often only had one name, and that was Chinaman. That was the case at school, on the streets, on the bus, and seemingly everywhere and anywhere. On the sidewalks, teenagers had a habit of entertaining themselves by creeping up behind a frail and elderly Asian immigrants and then frightening them by screaming at the top of their lungs, their worst imitation of the Chinese language. More often than not, racial slurs were backed by the threat of violence, and sometimes followed by violence itself. And because the racism of the perpetrators simply did not fit neatly into 
the politically correct narrative that our culture so often prizes, mainstream America paid no attention or simply looked away. In the ghetto, there was a general breakdown of law and order, an overwhelming absence of personal responsibility, and a widespread sense of entitlement. The welfare state was prevalent and it was supposed to help. It only made the place even more dysfunctional. It provided food stamps, but it could not stem hunger. It offered welfare checks, but it could not promote economic growth or create jobs. It excused laziness, turned a blind eye to gang banging, and condoned a breakdown of the family unit. Worst of all, it instilled a sense of entitlement in its subjects, and it took away their pride, sneered at their dignity, and sat their initiative. Thankfully, for my family, we didn't participate in the welfare state. This was in part because we spoke almost no English when we showed up in America, and we had no idea where or how to apply for welfare benefits. <laughs> we didn't even know that welfare benefits existed for people like us, and back then they definitely existed because this was the days before welfare reform of 1996, and poor illegal immigrants to this country did not have to have been here for five years before they became eligible for government money. Maybe we didn't take advantage of these welfare programs simply because we just weren't that bright. Um, we never bothered to even inquire about these benefits because it didn't occur to us or it hadn't occurred to us that coming to the United States meant that we should just hold out our hands and ask our federal or state government for money. But perhaps our ignorance was actually a blessing in disguise because that meant that we had to fight our way out of poverty the old fashioned way. We worked. We had limited financial resources, so my parents worked at menial jobs for long hours in the beginning for less than minimum wage. We wore clothing from Goodwill or handed down from our relatives. We used second, third, or fourth hand furniture. And at first, my brother and I each slept on half of the bed. He slept on the box springs and I slept on the mattress. I think he insisted back then that I got the better end of the bargain. There was hardship and shared sacrifice. The, the mother, who was once a well-respected school teacher, adored by her kids, became a seamstress uh, at a sweatshop. The father, who was once a senior mechanic trailed by a group of apprentices, became the kitchen help for a Chinese-owned restaurant where the owners regularly verbally abused their employees. The children studied day and night instead of hanging out on the streets, <clears throat> using drugs or otherwise poorly behaving. Our family saved for home ownership instead of splurging on long vacations, fancier clothing, or even better snacks. Because my parents couldn't speak English, and because my brother and I learned English much more quickly than they did, we took them to the hospital when they were sick. We filled out job applications for them when they were looking for work. We accompanied them to the unemployment office when they were laid off, and we haggled with the utilities companies, usually with adults many years older than we were, when they overcharged us. Through it all, we did not demand that the government level the playing field by giving us handouts or fees. We accepted that life was unfair and that not everybody, not everyone could be born rich or even born in this country. We certainly didn't occupy public buildings or parks. We didn't urinate on the streets. We didn't violate city ordinances. We did not destroy public park property or steal private property, even when things didn't go our way. And we thought it was wrong to feel entitled to government largesse or other people's money. We also didn't demand that America somehow give us preferences in the form of racial and ethnic quotas. 
In fact, being Asian in California pretty much meant that we didn't receive any of those quotas and preferences. But racial quotas and preferences were certainly doled out quite lavishly to sons and daughters of dentists, doctors, and other middle class professionals who belonged to racial categories that were far more in fashion in our society. Regardless, in the end, we prevailed. We prevailed over the welfare state. We got out. Certainly, we didn't do it alone. Uh, the kindness of the American people has always impressed me, and I think it's something that impresses all immigrants to this country. And we remain grateful to those who offered a helping hand and a warm smile. Recently, when I was reading an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal written by Governor Jeb Bush, uh, I thought of my family's journey in the ghetto. In his op-ed, Governor Bush said, today, the sad reality is that if you're born poor, if your parents didn't go to college, if you don't know your father, and if English is not spoken at home, then the odds are stacked against you. You are more likely to stay poor today than at any other time since World War II. What struck me about Governor Bush's op-ed was that all except one of his prerequisites for being condemned for poverty applied to me. Fortunately, I do know my father. But I was born poor, my parents didn't go to college, and English was not and still is not spoken at home. The odds were stacked against me. Folks like President Barack Obama has been eager to harp on those odds for political purposes. In the narrative that he has been peddling for the past four to five years, the little people at the bottom of our society simply don't get a fair shake. According to him, millionaires and billionaires, or the richest 1%, have edged out everyone else from opportunities for success. America's economy has become a club for the privileged few, and unless government, Barack Obama's government, intervenes heavily in the economy, the poor and the middle class will never thrive. In this paradigm, in Mr. Obama's paradigm, I had no business getting out of the ghetto, at least not without receiving a welfare check. This is because Mr. Obama doesn't just peddle the benefits of the welfare state. He really peddles the welfare state mentality. This mentality is even worse than the welfare state itself. It absolves individuals of personal responsibility. It consigns them to grievance, and it encourages, even justifies, their sense of entitlement. Since the election of last November, Republicans have been hyperventilating about how much more effectively Mr. Obama and his party can relate to the urban poor and minorities. Few seem willing to point out that the odds are always stacked against the poor. It's not supposed to be easy to get out of poverty. That's why you work harder, you pursue your opportunities more aggressively, and you learn to be more nimble and entrepreneurial. This is a reality that conservatives simply should not be ashamed or afraid to point out. In the conservative paradigm, in our paradigm, free men and women make choices. We take responsibility for our lives and we extract ourselves from less than stellar circumstances. That was how I got out of the ghetto. That was how I got out of the ghetto despite the odds. Unfortunately, the welfare state doesn't just exist in the ghetto. The ghetto is plagued with big government, racial strife, and a breakdown of law and order. But if you were to take away the latter two, or if you were to take away the high crime rates or the racial strife, big government is all over in this country, and you find the welfare state everywhere. The welfare state really isn't just about welfare. It's about government intrusion from the top and an entitlement and mentality from the bottom. We live in a country where collectively we spend more money than we have and where the takers would like to take more from the makers. We have a president who uses every opportunity he can to land base the successful, to tell Americans 
that fairness and progress can only occur when those who have the money give more of it via higher taxes to those who have less. Taking and spending other people's money is what Barack Obama likes to, to call our shared commitment to each other. And Americans agree with him. At least enough of us agreed with him to re-elect him as president last year. Unpleasant as it may be, the reality is that it is always, always difficult to convince people to say no to free money. It is always difficult to convince them to opt for the uncertainty of free markets and free enterprise and to walk away from government subsidies. I may have emerged from the ghetto without having received welfare benefits, but it was purely an accident. If I had known that welfare programs existed and that my parents qualified for those welfare programs, I would have brought them myself to the relevant government offices, filled out the applications, served as their translator in interviews with nameless bureaucrats, and at age 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever it was, I would have made sure that they got some free money. I never had to do any of that in Oakland, but certainly, like, other poor people, I had friends and families who did avail themselves of government benefits. And if my parents were to qualify for welfare programs today, I would still be the first to help them apply. The truth is, most people find it very hard to say no to free money, and most of us simply don't. We all respond to monetary incentives. Of course, we know that there's no such thing as free money. Our big government is funded by people who work, people who create wealth, people who pay taxes. And it is funded, funded by money we borrow uh, by a national debt of, of approximately $17 trillion. We also know that Barack Obama's welfare state does not just hand out welfare checks or food stamps. It also hands out goodies ranging from amnesty for, inner, for illegal immigrants free contraceptives for women, and racial preferences for minorities. If you're at the receiving ends of those goodies, it's very hard to say no. So the key is not to be giving out those goodies in the first place. I know I'm supposed to provide an uplifting story tonight, but the truth is we simply cannot defeat the welfare state on our own. In the grand scheme of things, it makes very little difference that my family and I made it out of the ghetto without receiving welfare benefits. We got lucky and we were able to escape the tentacles of the welfare state. To truly defeat the welfare state, however, we would have to defeat the welfare state mentality and we would have to roll back policies that incentivize dependency and foster a sense of entitlement. And when we do that, we will have a real story to tell about defeating the welfare state. And that would be a truly great story. So, but until then, I would merely leave you with this quote from my book. It's from um, the introduction. In China, I could not avoid the randomness, the ambiguity, or the all-encompassing weight of authoritarianism. But in the loving embrace of my family and the unflinching loyalty of my friends, I remained upbeat, cheerful, and happy. In the ghetto, I forgot what it meant to be joyful, but even in the ghetto, people have a chance to walk away from some of the worst attributes of a free society into its finest virtues. It is this belief that lies at the heart of my journey of getting to know freedom. And I hope that in the end, freedom will defeat the welfare state and its entire mentality. Thank you. Thank you very much.
for the uh, speaker. So if you have questions, raise your hand and we'll get a card. Thank you. Are you ready for the first question, Ian? Yes, I am. Okay. Can we, can, can we conclude from your remarks that a child's life in China between age 8 and 18 might be a better one than in the city of Oakland? Not necessarily. Uh, I think that every, I, I think that for people of my generation in China, um, no matter how happy they were in China, if they were given a chance to come to the United States, they would come. Um, and having gone through what I went through in Oakland, I don't regret coming to America. Um, I, I think that one lesson I would draw is that freedom isn't supposed to be easy. Just because you show up in a free society, um, a wealthy free society, doesn't mean that there are any guarantees. And that. so a success is, uh, is not going to be there waiting for you. And I think that for people who live in communist countries, like the former Soviet Union, for instance, they would much rather have the opportunity to fight for that freedom, to fight for their success, than to be consigned into a lifetime of mediocrity and hopelessness. Um, so I, I think it's hard to be an immigrant no matter what. It's hard to leave your friends and family. It's hard to leave a society that you're familiar with. Um, and, and I think that for kids leaving China today or any other country, that's going to be the case no matter what. Um, but, but in this country, I think the opportunity is always beckon, and it continues to beckon all kinds of people. OK. Do you have any ideas on how this ghetto life might change to become less dysfunctional? Well, since I left, I think Oakland has seen some improvement. That Oakland today isn't the same city it used to be. It's still very dysfunctional on many levels, and we saw that during Occupy Oakland. Um, I think policies that promote economic growth, um, policies that are business friendly, um, I think those help a lot. I think. Um, community groups and adults who actually teach children not to think with an entitlement mentality helps as well. Um, I think there are lots of things. I, I think part of it is that the government in Oakland tends to be very anti-free market, um, very, and, and it has not always been all that strong on law and order. Those things are very important if you want a safe and state, state, stable environment. Uh, but at the same time, you can't rely on the government to do everything. So um, part of the, the, the problem with Oakland is that the mentality, at least when I was growing up there, the mentality really was an awful one. And until you get at the root of that mentality, until you teach kids not to think that way anymore, um, things aren't going to change all that much. Now, this follow-up to that comment you just made is how, how would you help someone who is trapped in this mentality get out of it if you're a friend of theirs? Well, I would say a few things. Number one, uh, don't make any excuses for yourself. Uh, when you grow up in a poor environment and an unsafe environment, when your family doesn't have a whole lot of resources, it's very easy to make excuses. It's very easy to say, I can't do this, I can't do that, and I can't go places because my family simply hasn't provided for me, and, um, or you know, my people are oppressed, or whatnot. Uh, don't make any excuses for yourself. That's step number one. Uh, step number two, don't blame others. Uh, there, are, there are certainly bad people out there, and there are always going to be people who don't necessarily wish you well, but there are so many people who will always be there to lend a hand. Um, and if you have the right attitude, people will help you. People will give you a break. But you have to start by not blaming others. Um, what I saw so often in the ghetto was that people started blaming others, blaming history, and pretty soon you become quite self-destructive. Um, and the key is to get away from that. Um, and then of course the third thing, which really isn't anything new, is that one has to work hard. You have to take advantage of the opportunities that you have because poor people do have fewer opportunities than rich people. That is really just how it is. Uh, it, I grew up in a communist country before it liberalized its economy, and back then everybody had the same amount, the same number of opportunities, which was 
not very many. So, so the key is in a society that does provide opportunities, you have to take advantage of them. You have to apply yourself. Okay. How long did it take for your family to get a visa to get out of China? Uh, we. It took approximately four to five years. In fact, um, I wrote an article recently for foxnews.com called A Legal Immigrant Story, and you can find it on the <laughs> website. And in that story, I described how incredibly hard it was to jump through the hoops to actually do everything that America asked us to do in order to come here legally. And what's interesting is that these days you constantly hear people say, that, well, our immigration system is broken. Um, we wanted to come here legally, legally, but we couldn't, or there were just too many obstacles. But the truth is, lots of people actually stand in line and wait for a very long time. And they do that because they respect the rule of law, and they also respect the country that they wish to adopt as their home. And in my story, this. Um, story I wrote for foxnews.com titled A Legal Immigrant Story. I talk about that process. I talk about how hard it was. And I remember seeing my mom come home um, from the American consulate. And if she came home crying, I knew that our days for immigrating to America had to wait a little bit longer. Uh, so I think in our debate about comprehensive immigration reform, uh, we should absolutely not forget those people who are legal immigrants, and we should absolutely not let people talk us into forgetting the distinction between legal and illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get from a poor inner city education to Cornell University? Well, I was very, very, uh, I read a lot. I used to spend, so when I first came to this country, I didn't speak English, so what I did was I spent my summers reading Chinese novels, and they were very good novels, but most likely my parents, if they knew what was in those novels, would have said that they were really inappropriate for my age. But they were written by very famous novelists in Asia, and, uh, uh, and you know, and I spent my summers reading those novels. Uh, one, because I didn't have access to books like that in China when I was growing up back then under communist rule. You know, people weren't really allowed to any, read anything colorful or, or exciting. You read a lot of you read a lot of things that had a lot to do with communism and why communism was great. Um, and as I got a little bit older, and, and once I uh, began to learn English, I ended up spending a lot of time reading English books. And so. Um, it was terrible for my eyesight, but the great thing is that books take you to all kinds of places that you can't even imagine. And um, once I started digging into the books, I realized that there was a whole new world outside of the ghetto, and, and I was eager to get out as soon as I could. And, and one way for me to do that was to study as hard as I could. And that was what I did. Okay. What are your thoughts about the Gang of Eight Amnesty Bill currently discussed in Congress? <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> I didn't seem to fond of the idea of Marco Rubio running for president <laughs> earlier, uh, so I think that probably gives everybody a hint. Um, I think, um, well, first of all, I hope it fails. Um, I, At least I hope it fails in its current form. Uh, there were all kinds of efforts by different senators uh, recently to try to make amendments to the Gang of Eight proposal and to make it better to strengthen the immigrant to strengthen the enforcement mechanisms. But those amendments were all shot down. Uh, so in its current form, it's a disaster. It's a problem. It's now gotten to about a thousand pages long. Um, I, I. <laughs> I actually wrote another article about this. It's called Immigrating to America is Not an Entitlement, and it addresses many of the flaws. <laughs> and it addresses many of the common misperceptions of what immigration is about. Um, my, I have a number of disagreements, and I suspect that those of you in the audience do as well. I think that my number one disagreement with the bill is that it provides provisional 
legal status to approximately 11 million illegal immigrants who were in this country before any significant and meaningful measures of enforcement actually take place before the border is actually secure. That's a, I think that's a huge problem. But in addition to that, um, given that I've gone through the immigration process, I suppose I have a little bit of a problem with people saying that, well, America's immigration system is broken and hence we just get to, we get to come here illegally. Well, I'm sure that many of you here believe that our tax system is broken too and that you all believe that you don't want your tax dollars to go to our bloated welfare state. But it doesn't mean that you all of a sudden just stop paying your taxes and that if the IRS were to come after you, you would say, well, I believe our tax system is broken and hence I stop paying. So, but that is, however, the situation we have with our immigration system. It is broken. Everybody acknowledges that. Let's fix it. But somehow, simply because of the fact that it's broken, all these people now have a claim to being here because they just want to, because they, they aspire to be Americans. Um, I have a number of other disagreements with it, but I would point you to my, my article. Um, I think the title tells you how I feel about this issue. Okay. How do you explain the Chinese immigrants who come here, presumably to escape tyranny, and immediately join and vote for liberal Democrats? <laughs> <laughs> Some of our most progressive politicians are here from China. <laughs> <laughs> I would say a few things. Um, I'm actually not. Sh I, I, I'm not convinced that people who escape tyranny from China come here and immediately start voting for liberal Democrats. Some of them probably do when they become citizens, but I, I haven't seen enough studies that say that these folks, the anti-communist folks in fact are more likely to vote Democrat than they are to vote Republican. What I do know is that oftentimes when you get to second or third generation Chinese Americans, they do tend to be less conservative than their parents because the immigration experience is farther away from them. The hardships that they, their parents or their grandparents had to go through aren't as relevant to them. And many of these kids have, you know, apply themselves and, and end up at very good colleges, and at these colleges, what happens is that they get brainwashed by liberal professors and a, and a liberal administration. <laughs> uh, so I think that's part of the problem. What is also part of the problem is that folks who tend to be very politically active in the Asian community, a lot of the activists that you see, particularly on the national level, tend to be a lot more liberal than the people you meet on the streets than you know, than sort of your average Asian American, um, particularly more recent immigrants, um, for whatever reason these, these Asian American activists have decided that unless they adopt the rhetoric of the left wing, the rhetoric of identity politics, the rhetoric of victimology, then somehow they have failed. But many of these activists don't necessarily speak the native languages of their respective communities. They don't necessarily know all that much or all the details of the people they, um, the, or the, all the difficulties of the people they claim to represent. Um, and in many ways, you know, you can see a parallel between the Asian community and the black community. Lots of black folks would say that Jesse Jackson, Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton probably doesn't represent their points of view. Somebody like former representative Alan West would, would have, in fact, has said that quite a bit. Um, in the Asian community, it's an issue that's not as pronounced, um, I think because the community probably isn't as politically active as a whole, but, um, but there is also that disconnect from those national uh, self-appointed spokespeople, um, a disconnect between them and your average Asian American citizen simply because, you know, they simply because the former doesn't always understand the latter all that well, and I think the latter tends to be a bit more conservative. The third thing I would say is that I think immigrant communities tend to be more pragmatic, um, and because China has undergone 30 years of 
economic liberalization is not the same communist country as it used to be. It still is very repressive in many ways, but I think for a lot of younger Chinese, they don't who they don't necessarily know those awful days of the at least they don't know intimately the awful days of the Cultural Revolution or those days of starvation under Chairman Mao. Um, and so sometimes they actually can be very nationalistic instead, you know, so instead of of very hostility toward communism, they might actually be very nationalistic toward China. Um, and I think overall the community isn't may not be as ideological as, for instance, the Cuban American community. And when people are less ideological and more practical, if you give them or promise them a whole bunch of goodies, they are likely to respond that way. So if Mitt Romney says, I'm gonna cut the size of government, I'm gonna cut um, I'm gonna, you know, reform entitlement programs, and you know, and I'm gonna do tax reform. But the other side says, well, that just means he's gonna cut your benefits, and he's gonna take away Medicare, and so on. People respond to that because for a lot of folks, these are pocketbook issues, and um, and and part of it is that they could very well swing the other way if you have someone who's who actually is a more charismatic. Um, political uh, candidate, someone who can speak more directly to their concerns. Um, so, so I've given you a whole bunch of reasons, I guess. Okay. How can we find, befriend, and appropriately help an immigrant family? Well, I think immigrants are, um, I mean, they're all over the Bay Area, obviously, is full of immigrants. Um, there are lots of community groups. I think community groups that, as whenever a particular group is close to the local level, I think they tend to understand the needs of the people in that community far better. Um, I mean, there there are lots of things you can do. There, you know, when I was a kid living in Oakland, one of the things I benefited the most from was a program called the Arthur Ashe Tennis Program. Um, I think. Um, it, this was something founded by um, uh, Arthur Ashe, mm -hmm. who he, he was um, a tennis star. He, he was a, a, the first African American to win Wimbledon, and he founded this program for inner city kids to learn to play tennis and, you know, to give them something to do so that they wouldn't be out on the streets and to, you know, to have coaches teach them sportsmanship and self-respect. And, and that was where I learned to play tennis. And um, the folks who taught in that program. They didn't get paid all that much. I know. I mean, if they were to give private tennis lessons, I'm sure they would have gotten paid a lot more. And that was something I benefited from quite a bit. And I think there are all kinds of programs like that. There are ways to tutor folks. Uh, there are ways to. Um, um, there are ways to even if you were, let's say, donate, um, you know, donate clothing or money. I, I'm sure there are lots of groups out there that are there to serve the immigrant communities um, and you know and their needs range from everything from food to clothing to or you know sometimes to translation uh, translation help um, to things like you know maybe sometimes they need uh, legal services and can't afford them I mean there there are there is a wide range of services uh, that folks need and I think there is no shortage of groups here in the Bay Area that try to help them getting involved with one of those groups would be, you know, is one way to do it. Another way is if I think a lot of times, you know, it doesn't, it perhaps doesn't even require participation in some sort of organization, right? I think just being kind and, and being decent to somebody, um, treating an immigrant just like you would treat one of your friends, I think that often goes a long way to make an immigrant feel at home in this country. And I think that would be a good place to start. Okay. Do you have any ideas on how to encourage young people in ghettos to seek role models from successful people and other individuals with backgrounds that might help them? Yeah. Well, you know what? I would actually say that, to, especially to people in the ghetto, um, there are role models everywhere. I think our culture has just gotten so politically correct that we often make it seem like if somebody does not share your color or your ethnicity, or your cultural background, that somehow you can't look up to them. And so, you know, we're constantly saying we have to provide a role model 
for a particular community. We have to find people of that race, that gender, that ethnicity. Um, I mean, it, I think it's great to find role models of any gender or ethnicity or culture or race. It, I think that for young people, we shouldn't sort of, uh, one of the things that adults or authority figures who deal with young people a lot, what they shouldn't do is to inculcate in young people's heads that somehow the only people you can look up to must look like you or sound like you. That's simply not the case. Um, you know, when I was growing up in Oakland, um, one of the instructors who was the kindest to me was, you know, an African American uh, instructor. He taught uh, he taught me in fifth grade, and, and unfortunately, he's passed away since then. But but I remember that you know this was my second year in the United States, and I knew how to do math really well, but I didn't speak English all that well. And he noticed that I worked really hard to learn, um, and I carried this pocketbook dictionary with me everywhere so that if any time I encountered a word or a phrase I didn't understand, I would look it up and see what the Chinese translation was. And, and he went out of his way to, you know, to help me um, acc one, acclimate to American society, but also to constantly encourage me to do better. And so it didn't matter to me that he wasn't Chinese. It didn't matter, you know, it, 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 it didn't matter to me that he was black. And, and he used to tell all the, and, and my, in, in the class that I had with him, um, most of the students in that class were black, and he used to tell the black kids all the time that they needed not to slack off, they needed to stop making excuses, that they needed to work harder. Um, and it was great that they had a role model like him, but you know, but just because you don't have a role model that shares your ethnicity or color doesn't mean that you know somehow you should stop looking. There are all kinds of people. And I've seen all kinds of folks who have been willing and able to mentor people didn't share their gender or ethnicity or, or cultural background. And I think that actually, I think we, I, th I think the mentoring goes both ways. People who mentor you have to be willing to do it, but you have to be willing to open yourself up to people who wish you well and who want to help. And, and the first step is to, you know, to allow those people who may not look like you or sound like you to do that. Okay. Do you have two or three specific recommendations for the city of Oakland to improve itself? <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. I actually haven't thought of that. I, um, I haven't. I haven't lived there for a while, and I know the city has changed quite a bit. Um, and. Um, you know, and, and I, I remember that under uh, Mayor Jerry Brown, I actually do remember that number of improvements were made, and I appreciated those improvements. Um, I sort of feel like perhaps I've been gone for, for so long that this question probably would be better answered by a resident of Oakland who actually, I mean, you know, who actually has to deal with the city government as well as other aspects of the city um, more regularly. Um, I would say that for most, I mean, for, for me, for when it comes to making changes in inner city areas, I think it's very, very crucial for those areas to become business friendly, to encourage small businesses, to, to encourage entrepreneurship. Um, and I, you know, must, I have to go back to the mentality, uh, and, you know, and the mentality amongst the city's residents is fostered not just by people in the government, but also your families, your churches, your communities, and your schools. And so I think, you know, it's for those cities that have um, inner city areas that require a lot of help, I think getting to the root of that mentality is very key. Okay. Many immigrants have dual citizenship and allegiance to the country from where they came. Our, our system recognizes dual citizenship. Do you think this should change? I think that at the moment, um, dual citizenship isn't allowed for every, not for everybody. So dual citizenship is not allowed for people who, um, who, emigrated, who immigrated to the U.S. from China, for instance. Um, usually I think dual citizenship is only allowed for for those countries 
that are friendly to us. So if you're a dual Swiss and U.S. citizen, most people would likely think that you're going to be harmless. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I, I, uh, my understanding is that if your home country is a country that's considered to be hostile to the United States, it's um, mo for the most part, it's very the government won't actually allow you to hold dual citizenship. You either stick with the citizenship that you originally had, or you renounce it and then become an American citizen, which you know makes perfect sense to me. Okay. Imagine that you are put in charge of U.S. immigration policy. What would you? What would it look like, and why? <laughs> uh, well. Um, I, I would go back to what I said earlier. I think um, strengthening enforcement mechanisms is very key. Until uh, you do that, the rest of the talk is pretty much just talk. Um, if you're not going to enforce our borders, if you're not going to deport people um, on a meaningful basis. So, for instance, right now, um, there is a union within um, the in the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Unit. Um, and those officers complain that what the Obama administration won't let them do is two things that are very crucial to, um, to their jobs. One is to actually detain folks who are here illegally, and two is to deport them. And the Obama administration has, taken, has kind of adopted this policy that once you're here, unless you've committed some sort of serious crime, you're, I mean, it's, you know, the, the administration is not going to spend that much time, you know, figure, <laughs> deporting you or spend that, you know, spend all, uh, too many resources uh, on things like that. And so when you have an immigration policy that really doesn't have a whole lot of teeth and that when, you know, when people don't think that there is severe punishment uh, or severe consequences to coming here illegally, then, you know, obviously we have a broken system. Uh, I do believe that we should make this country far more friendly to skilled laborers from overseas. Um, there are lots of people who would uh, provide a lot of help to our economy, who would provide their skills and their expertise, and every year folks like that who get uh, what's called an H-1 visa. Those visas, there's a small quota for them, and usually they, the, you know, all the employers in the country that would like to hire people like that, they run out of, run out of um, visas like that at the very beginning of the year, and that was the case this year. They ran out of um, those equipment. They, they sort of hit the limit um, of those visas in January, I believe. So I think it actually makes a lot of sense to make it easier for scientists and mathematicians um, um, and others with high skills to actually come here and, and provide their expertise and help our economy grow. Um, I think that um, we need to get away from the identity politics that's often being played um, on immigration policy. Unfortunately, it's very hard to do because many uh, illegal immigrants, currently the largest group of illegal immigrants in this country, um, are Hispanics and then the largest group within that are Mexicans, and so it's often very hard to separate the two, but the key is we actually need to have people who would be willing and not afraid to say that just because we want to enforce our immigration laws and just because we want to secure our borders does not mean that we're a bunch of racists. Um, and, and I think that's actually a tone, you know, Republicans are constantly talking about how we got the tone wrong in the last election. Well, one one thing we should do is to set the right tone, and the tone is we should get you know stop actually letting people um, characterize conservatives as racist just because they want to secure our borders. You know, I think rule of law is something that conservatives have always cared a lot about, and we shouldn't give up on that debate or cede that debate to the other side just because we lost an election. And by the way, um, even if we did have Hispanic vote in the last election, Romney would not have won. So, um, anyway, I, I, I think that um, there are lots of folks out there who have thought very intelligently and, and, um, and thoroughly about the immigration issue. Um, 
But what we do have right now is obviously things that don't, a system that doesn't work very well. And we also have a proposal, the name of a proposal that's very uh, imperfect. So we need to get beyond that. Have you ever considered running for office? <laughs> well, but didn't you hear me earlier? I was thinking about running for president. <laughs> that was why I wrote, that's why I wrote this book about myself. <laughs> and then, of course, since, you know, since I'm not a natural born citizen, it turns out I can't do that anymore. <laughs> As uh, conservatives, should we stop using the term illegal immigrants? No, absolutely not. <laughs> And that's obviously not just Chinese, but as Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, whatever. And so what would what, what do you think would be the appeal to win this group of people to the conservative Republican side? Yeah, uh, I uh, have been asked that question a number of times since the, the last election. I don't think anybody has done any extensive polling or any substantive studies in the Asian community to ask people why they voted the way they did. So I think everybody who's talked about it um, really has just been taking a guess. Um, and I've offered a few educated guesses, um, one of which, which I, I mentioned earlier, which is that I, I think second or third generation Asian Americans oftentimes are a bit more, they, they have a tendency to be a bit more liberal or much more liberal than their parents or grandparents. Um, I think in Governor Romney's case, my guess is that it's quite possible that his very tough rhetoric on China ended up turning off a lot of uh, folks in the Chinese community. Like I said earlier, these days there are a lot of Chinese immigrants who are very nationalistic about China. Um, and there are also lots of Americans who disagree with Governor Romney's proposals on what to do with China. Um, and I don't agree with him 100% um, uh, on many issues. But I think if you're somebody who's very nationalistic about China or your heritage, if you hear um, a, one of the political candidates constantly talk about China and getting tough with China, and I have no doubt that Governor Romney was talking about getting tough with the Chinese communist regime, but oftentimes voters don't make that distinction. They, they might just think that, you know, they, they might think that Governor Romney is being anti-China, and then they might think that, well, maybe he's anti-Chinese. So that's simply a guess. Um, um, I think somebody would have to do a study and actually ask folks why they voted the way that they did. Um, and then in addition to that, um, as I, I mentioned earlier, Governor Romney also um, promised that he would roll back big government. And I was, you know, I, I voted for him and was certainly counting on him to do that. But the immigrant community is not, um, is not insensitive uh, to monetary incentives. And as I said earlier, there are lots of immigrants who do avail themselves of government freebies. And these days, most people are not, I guess, are not as ignorant as my parents or my family was when we came here. People know where to go to find free money. People know where to go to apply for welfare benefits, and people know what to do to um, make themselves appear eligible before government bureaucrats when they need to apply for um, needs test tested benefits. And so people know, and I think that many of those people probably do vote, and when they hear that one candidate is going to roll back the government, they probably think that, you know, that would affect their pocketbooks, that that would mean fewer benefits for them. Um, so, and I know that many people feel that the Asian community probably is supposed to be more inclined to be conservative, that it's a community that's hardworking and industrious, and, um, and in, many, in many ways it is true, but just because that is true doesn't mean that people don't want free money or would say no to it and you know and if you're a hard-working immigrant and you come here poor and the government offers you free money you're going to take it you're not going to you know it's very unlikely that you would say no and i think that actually that that probably has an impact on how people vote as well 
Okay, this maybe is a question of optimism versus pe pessimism. If you look down the road 30 to 40 years, what is your, uh, what do you think the state of the welfare state will be? Uh, I think we need to, uh, I think conservatives need to start winning some of the elections. Um, they need to run some candidates who are charismatic, articulate, viable, and conservative, free market thinkers, um, and that we need to take back the White House, we need to take back the Senate, because if, if the government continues to be run, our federal government continues to be run by people who are big government types, the welfare state will become ever more bloated. We will be staring down a path that Greece is currently on, um, and our society will become a huge entitlement state. So. Um, I would say I am, I would like to be fairly optimistic. I would like to think that there are viable conservative candidates out there who can articulate a message without compromising on their principles. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there are lots of governors out there right now who, um, you know, who filled that void. Uh, but I think that the key thing to do is to start winning some elections and then we can turn things around. Okay, uh, some people say because communism, communist China is becoming a world economic power, the communism is superior to capitalism. What do you think? Aha! Uh -huh. So I've written about that too. <laughs> um, I, I think what people say is that, so folks like President Obama um, and liberal columnists like Thomas Friedman from the New York Times, as well as many other big government types, Ever since the financial crisis hit, um, they have been advocating uh, heavy government spending. They wanted more stimulus spending. They wanted more infrastructure spending. They wanted more funding for renewable energy projects. Uh, they wanted all kinds of things. And, um, and when they got pushed back from free market types and folks who believe in limited government, they started saying using China as uh, as their example. And they started using China to go to uh, conservatives into sort of uh, this position of having to adopt their rhetoric. So China, as many of you know, has grown dramatically in the past three to decades or so. They began undertaking economic growth in 1978. They opened up their economy to the world. Um, but it's still a communist country. It is still politically uh, uh, oppressive. And a lot of things are still run by the state, and which is why commentators these days like to refer to China's economy as a state capitalist economy. And folks like Barack Obama, for, the, for a long time, he kept pointing to the roads and bridges that China was building and saying, you know, why are we watch, just sitting here watching them build these roads and bridges, airports, and other big infrastructure projects while our infrastructure here is crumbling. He also says, why are we sitting here not willing to give our renewable energy companies funding while China is just, just shoving money in these companies' directions and China has do you know, gotten to a point where it now dominates the solar uh, industry. So, folks, so for liberals, China is kind of, they're, when they look at the Chinese government, they see something that they would love to have, which is the ability to spend freely without accountability to voters. Um, and it's very exciting to them, you know. There aren't any tea party types. Um, you know, and... So, but, but when I've written about this topic, um, the, what the research showed and what the facts are is that China started growing dramatically, largely because it introduced more free market mechanisms into its economy, um, not because it became more statist. So the Chinese economy today is much freer than what it was 32 years ago uh, when they first started their economic liberalization revolution. Um, and, and numerous 
Chinese reform-minded folks, whether in government, in academia, or just small and medium-sized enterprises in China, they all recognize that the hand of the government is intruding and interfering with the economy, and it creates all kinds of inefficiencies these days. It um, creates or supports monopolies that are um, that benefit lots of large state-owned enterprises. Um, and it suffocates certain industries. And so what a lot of reform-minded Chinese officials and economists actually, what they advocate is that they would like to see further economic reform. In fact, this is something that the new Chinese leadership has been talking about. This is something that they would like to see too. They believe that in order to, for their economy to grow in the long run, um, to really get to a modern first world economy, they will have to implement some changes. It's um, Barack Obama has been, you know, he certainly has talked a lot about becoming more stages like China, but what a lot of Chinese recognize is that they actually need to become more free market oriented. So I would say, um, I, and this is something I say all the time, you just shouldn't listen to Barack Obama. <laughs> believe that many first-generation Chinese, the most conservative ones, do not vote? Uh, that, I, I'm not sure about that. Here in California, we make voting very easy for Chinese immigrants. There are ballots in, that are translated into Chinese, so even if you don't speak the language fluently, you can go get yourself a Chinese ballot and then, you know, fill in the circles. Um, Obviously, that's not the case in other states with smaller um, immigrant populations, but um, I, I, would, I would just say that here in California, it's very easy for immigrants to vote. So many things are bilingual, multilingual. Um, whether immigrants actually vote or not um, is a different issue. Um, I, am not, I haven't seen the polls or the study, so I, I'm not totally sure about the the voting rates within a particular immigrant population, but I, I mean, I'm sure that like other, <laughs> you know, in America, I think there are lots of people who don't vote, so it wouldn't surprise me if lots of first generation immigrants don't vote either. Do you think America is still free? Uh, I think lots of things are relative, so uh, when people, ask me that question, um, I usually ask, well, compared to what, right? Um, you know, there is an index of economic freedom, and so every year, Hong Kong and Singapore um, come out at the very top of it. So compared to Hong Kong and Singapore, our economy isn't nearly as free. Uh, but when it comes to political freedom or other measures, um, you know, we certainly are much freer than Modern day China were much freer than Russia, for instance. Um, and then I would say that um, you know when I, I I continue to refer to our society as a free society. I think there are <coughs> ways for our markets to be freer. Um, I think that there is a lot of government intrusion that interferes with that. Um, but uh, but in, you know in, in recent years, as a result of the financial crisis and the economic intervention that's taken place, our um, you know, economic activity certainly has gotten less free, and certainly with the passage of Obamacare, but, but I remain hopeful that some of those things can be rolled back. Follow the question. You came from Guangzhou, which is neighboring to Hong Kong, yes. and how, how does the United States' freedom of economics compare with Hong Kong? I think economically, Hong Kong has an extremely free economy. Like I said earlier, Hong Kong constantly is ranked by you know conservative or free market um, uh, inst uh, research institutes as either the number one or number two freest economy in the world. So um, when you talk about when you talk about it that way, our economy definitely is less free compared to Hong Kong's. I think that's it. Thank you.